Hello Canucks fans and welcome back to another episode of Canucks Conversation brought to you as always by the 2024 Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X is Toyota's brand new all-electric SUV that is designed to go the distance for you and your family. The BZ4X is packed with Toyota's coolest tech but it still has that trusty SUV feel you know and love and even though it's electric... It's capable of effortlessly conquering any terrain where there's rain, snow, mud, or your friends' questionable post-game recaps. The BZ4X will get you through it all. My name is Dave Guadrelli. That is Harmon Dial. Folks, we said yesterday, geez, what's today's show going to be about? We might not know a playoff opponent. We're just going to be previewing this game against the Winnipeg Jets. We're not going to have much to talk about. That's what we thought yesterday. Foolishly, we thought that because Mason Marchment gets the job done gets that game to overtime between the Dallas Stars and the St. Louis Blues last night, which means that Harmon, we now know the Vancouver Canucks will be facing the Nashville Predators in round one. Yeah, look, there was never going to be an easy matchup in the first round in the Western Conference There, the way there is in the East, for example, where you have a couple of teams in the Capitals and the Islanders that aren't true playoff caliber opponents. But let's be honest, stylistically, this is the best matchup for Vancouver relative to a Los, a-, a Los Angeles team that had Vancouver's number in the regular season that played that stingy defensive style and a Vegas team that is going to have Mark Stone back, is going to have Alex Petrangelo back uh, and obviously won the Stanley Cup last year. So with Nashville, the thing, the thing to keep in mind is First of all, before we even get to the analysis of the series, from a pure entertainment standpoint, having playoff ho- playoff hockey back in Vancouver, this is going to be an entertaining series in the sense that Nashville is a fast team. They generate a lot of chances. They attack off the rush. They play a more open style. They're not run and gun, but they're not going to slow the game down to a crawl the way an opponent like L.A. would have. So from a pure aesthetic perspective, first and foremost, this is going to be a blast of a series to cover. You willing to call it a first round buy? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so let's get into it. Let, let, we'll get into it tonight versus Winnipeg. I want to get this out of the way because I think we're going to talk mostly about this series and I want to talk mainly about this series, but I want to get the Winnipeg game out of the way first. I said yesterday, I don't know if I gave odds, but there's probably like a 25% chance I'll watch the game tonight. Uh, like I'll, I'll maybe go back and watch the highlights. No, I'll definitely do that, but you know, not many people are going to be watching the game tonight, and for, and for good reason. It's game 82. There's not going to be much going on. The only thing you're hoping for is that nobody gets hurt. In that news, we have this from Rick Tockett at Morning Skate today. He went over um, the guys that will be sitting, and then he was asked about Quinn Hughes because Quinn Hughes is going to play in this game, and he kind of gave the reason uh, why Quinn Hughes is playing in this game. It'll be Demko. Uh, Demers in that, yep. So aside from uh, Besser being left back in Vancouver, who is out, who's in tonight, Rick? Uh, Millsy will be out, uh, Heronic and uh, Cole. Is keeping uh, Hughes in part of the reason you're trying to get him the, the scoring title for the no, defenseman? No, he's healthy and, uh, you know, we need to, we need to, you know, fill the, I, I, you know, fill the team. Like, you know, I wish I could have 10 guys out, but we can't. Okay, a couple things there. You, you already grinning. You know exactly what I'm going to go in on at the end there. I wish I could have 10 guys out there, but I can't. You have to field a team. I looked at the NHL rule book. There is nothing saying that you need to have a minimum number of players. There's nothing in there. Like I, I couldn't find it anywhere. I asked Brennan Bachelor. Brennan Bachelor and I were looking it up together. I don't think Bachelor knows why I asked but he did try to help me. So we were looking and we couldn't find anything. Batch and I looked and we couldn't find anything. And I, I scrolled through the NHL rule book, could not find anything about needing a minimum number of players. So technically, just throwing it out there, talk, it says he wants to have 10 players. Do it, do it. Nobody's going to stop you. Although someone might actually stop you. I shouldn't say nobody's going to stop you. Might A few people might stop you there, but I can't find anything. I can't find anything in the rule book about a minimum. There's a maximum. You can't have more, but there's nothing about a minimum number of players. That's interesting. You should uh, you should be furiously sending these screenshots of the rule book to, to talk it. Maybe it'll uh, change his mind a bit. Well, I don't want him to change his mind because harm tomorrow. I've got a reservation with the old co-host of this show. At a certain steakhouse for a bet that we made before the season started that Quinn Hughes, I said he would score 20 goals. Quinn Hughes is at 17. 
if he if 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 Quinn you you know what I should take it all back about not watching the show or not watching the game. I'm going to because I need to will on the Quinn Hughes hat trick. You know, you don't cheer as media. You don't cheer. You want to see good hockey, all that, all that stuff. I'm cheering. I'm cheering tonight. I want three goals from Quinn Hughes. I'll just be all honest about it. I need three goals from Quinn Hughes tonight. That's what I'm hoping for tonight. Just prep your wallet, buddy. It's just prep your wallet. That's all I'm going to say. Be ready. I wish I could tell you that like the vibes were saying, yeah, it's a hattie from Quinn tonight. No, they're not. Like, unless Quinn also has has a little side side bet with someone where he's like, yeah, if I score 20, you have to take me to dinner. So I don't know. Then that's the only way Quinn Hughes, Quinn Hughes would score a hat trick tonight because man, you're gonna need you're gonna need at least em- an empty netter. Yes. Oh, that's that's true. Absolutely. But that's the thing is, like, think of his goals, right? Now we're gonna analyze a little bit. <laughs> a lot of Quinn Hughes' goals come from just like, okay, I need to take this into my own hands. Nothing's going for us. We need a goal so badly. Is Quinn Hughes gonna like walk the line with a bunch of poise and like really? push hard to the net if the Canucks are down by two with like six minutes to go. I'm not saying he's not going to try, but I'm going to say, I'm just, all I'm saying is it's very unlikely that Quinn Hughes scores tonight. Yeah. Like I said, get your uh, wallet ready, bud. It's ready. It's ready. Okay. Uh, so we went over the guys who were sitting, uh, JT Miller, Philip Ronick, Ian Cole. It is a day that ends in Y, so Ian Cole is going to be sitting. Any surprise on Philip Ronick, uh, JT Miller? I feel like we kind of knew with Brock Besser. Like I said it on yesterday's show, he's the guy that stayed home. I guessed that he would be the guy because he's been getting maintenance for the past couple of months, or weeks, I should say. But any surprise there, Miller, Ronick sitting? Not surprised, but it is worth noting that Miller is on 799 career regular season games, which means this had he suited up would have been 800 instead 800 for him will be the first game of uh, of next season so so that's worth uh, keeping in mind as far as milestones go but outside of that i mean i'm not too surprised these are guys that have played uh, important roles for you big heavy minutes and in cole's case especially he's, he's the oldest guy on the roster and um, has looked like a player especially in the second half that could benefit from some uh, load management Okay, and we're going to talk about what that load management might accomplish and what it all means because we're going to talk about the first round series with the Predators and the Canucks. But before we do that, is there anything else you want to say about the game? No. Okay. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Okay, then let's get to our Light the Lamp contest, which is still happening tonight, folks. Uh, Brought to you by our friends at Four Winds Brewing. Vancouver is playing Winnipeg tonight, and we want to know who's going to score the first goal for Vancouver. If you nail it, you could win a $25 gift card to the Four Winds Tap Room, located at 72nd and River Road in Delta. Enter by following us on social media. Keep an eye out for today's show clip and comment who you think will light the lamp and score the first goal tonight. Winners will be contacted directly. Check us out at Canucks Army on Twitter, at CanucksArmy.com on Instagram, and Canucks Army on Facebook. And make sure you ask about Four Winds Light, Light Logger at your local liquor store, or have some delivered to your front door through the online shop at fourwindsbrewing.ca. Harm, I'm going to say Quinn Hughes. I'm going to help you out here. I'm going I'm to push for Quinn, too. I love it. Last time okay, I so did people- that, he scored. That's true. That's right. That's absolutely right. Okay, I like it, man. The vibes. Grady, uh, can we say that you're you're can we put you down for Quinn Hughes too? Maybe he'll score three tonight because we've got Grady down there as well as our third. Okay. People are asking questions about the uh background harm because this was really good. Where is it? Yeah. This is from Corey Anderson, obviously regular listener of the show. This must hurt quads a lot. He won't even decorate his room, let alone spend big bucks on a dinner. Look, people are asking where the Luongo growth chart is. I said it on a past episode. The NHL legal department did not like that. They don't like logos on, on the shows. So, we're yeah, it's gone. It's gone. That's what happened. It's gone. Um, but <clears throat> anyways, there was a few other things asking me to decorate the room better. Uh, Nars asking if I was shrinking and that's why I got rid of the growth chart because I didn't want to get exposed. Nope, that wasn't it either. Uh, But (laughs) Viper's Whip. I don't drink alcohol, so I don't care who scores first. You can still win. They got they got good stuff over there. They got good stuff at the top. You can always give that to a buddy. Come on now. Yeah, I know. Come on, Viper's Whip. Yeah, make make a guess here. Come on, let's go. (laughs) Yeah, Narav. A Mariners jersey and not a Canucks jersey is crazy for a Canucks show host. The Mariners and the MLB haven't sent us any angry letters. That's all I'm going to say. 
and I'm wearing my Mariners <laughs> hat. So I'm just leaving it at that. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the news, we'll get to it later, but obviously the NHL approves the relocation to Utah. We'll get to it. That's an anyone else question. So folks, get your anyone else's in early, but man, this is going to We also to got be... a Pod Coles an extension to talk about in, uh, in anyone else. That's right. The big news of the day is Utah. <laughs> Utah, not Pod Coles. I, I honestly... Yeah, two-year deal for Pod Colson, one million per year. Let's just get out of the way now, Harm. Let's we'll get to the series yeah, okay. after. Let's get out of the way. Pod Colson, actually, of course, that is big news. Let's talk about it. Uh, Vasily Pod Colson signs a two-year extension with the Canucks. I'll give you my analysis first. Mine is they showed him what Nils Huglander did and said, "We want this to be you next year." Yeah, and ultimately, it's we'll, we'll keep it short and sweet, right? It's it's tidy work. Uh, the Canucks have a lot of expiring bottom six forwards, and you're probably not going to be able to retain all of them. Right, like a Sam Lafferty, for example. If Pod Colson takes another step heading into next season, could he replace Lafferty's type of bottom six impact with the four checking, hopefully some of the secondary offense, the physicality being heavier along the walls? It's definitely possible. I mean, since Pod Colson has been recalled, it's it's too bad that the offensive results haven't come. But as far as four checking, as far as being a disruptive high motor presence. It's been encouraging to track his performance since he was recalled uh, in March and sort of established himself as an everyday everyday player, uh, leapfrogging Nils Amon and um, Phil DiGiuseppe on the depth chart in uh, in the process too. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, what's the conversation you and I have had many times this year, Harm, was, yeah, you want Dakota Joshua re-signed, but ultimately you trust the Canucks Pro Scouting to go out and find you the next Dakota Joshua, right? And I'm, again, I'm not not trying to say that's what Pod Colson has to be, but, you know, this coaching staff must feel like they can get more out of Pod Colson than what they have right now, and management must feel the same way as well. So again, you want to have this kind of thing in your organization. I, tidy work, tidy work, like you said. Anything else that you want to say about Pod Colson? No, I, I want to talk about this playoff series, man. He leads them in hits per 60. I read that today. Really? He leads the team in hits per 60, which I don't not know if that that's surprising. a great sign. It's not, it's not that surprising, but it's also not a great sign because I, I, I don't always buy this, but everybody says, oh, if you're leading the team in hits, it's because you are not you don't have the puck often. It's like, okay, with Pod Colson, I kind of buy that thinking a little bit. Like, you'd like to see him have the puck a little bit more is what I'm saying. Uh, but you I like can... that he's throwing his body around. But you can look at players' possession numbers now, and I actually haven't had a chance to check, ironically enough, but I would assume that his two-way numbers have been totally fine this year. It's not as if the Canucks have been caved in defensively when he's been been on the ice. So I don't take the high number of hits as a sign that he's been chasing the play too much. In fact, I've been impressed at how he started to use that enhanced physicality to carve out a distinct role for himself, right? Because that's you always no go on, that's go on. always the challenge for fourth line players, right? If you're trying to first crack, crack crack and make your way into the NHL as an everyday player is what's your specialty, right? What's your role? What's your identity? Take a player like Nils Amon, for example, right? He doesn't hurt you. He's safe defensively, but what's the specialty, right? Because you could argue, okay, well, he kills penalties. Could it be as a defensive guy? But he's a 45% faceoff guy, right? If you're going to develop a specialty as a defensive fourth liner, then you've got to be able to win your faceoffs. Um, and he doesn't do that, right? So he doesn't have enough of a specialty that way. Doesn't drive enough offense. Uh, he's not elite enough on the PK where you look at him and go, oh, well, he has to be in the lineup to help you shorthanded. And he doesn't play with enough physicality to to check the prototypical energy guy box either, right? So you can look at Nils Amon and say, he doesn't hurt you, but what's his identity to become a player that you have as one of your top 12 forwards in the lineup? Whereas Pod Colson now, you probably would have had the same question mark before he started developing this physical identity because the off offense isn't there yet. The defensive side of his game isn't there yet. He doesn't kill penalties, so he has to embrace the idea of being an energy uh energetic presence being physical being hard to play against uh especially because he's a bigger guy right i wonder how many playoff games he gets into um and again like game one of the playoffs i don't know if he'll be in but our friend patrick johnson over at the province has been kind of hinting it that we might see a back-to-back -back game six seven situation i don't again we don't know the schedule hasn't come out just yet but 
that might be a time you want Vasily Podkolzin rested and back in the lineup. Yeah, I mean the way he's playing right now, I don't mind him in a, in a fourth line role as um, as is like that twelfth forward spot. It's not as if anybody else has really grabbed the the bull by the horns, right? So I mean, I I wouldn't even be opposed to having him in your game one lineup. I, I think like it's it. all relative to the role that he's playing in about the the hits there, quads, because he's basically now set the floor of being a bottom six, a fourth line player, and if he can get those counting stats up if he can get his defensive game a little more sharper especially at that price like you need that cheap depth and you know he's not going to live up to the draft pedigree i don't think at this point but he can get closer to that level we saw in his first year when he popped was it 14 goals off so i think he... yeah like what i was saying at the start is like niels huglander that's the model right guy yeah. comes in he's AHL. on a super cheap deal and again, now you're looking at Nils Hoglanders being one of their highest value players this year and, of course, next mm -hmm. year because it's a two-year deal. So you're hoping, like, again, Vasily Podkolzin doesn't have to go score 20 goals next year. But, yeah, you're right, Grady. Like, you're hoping the counting stats can just kind of take a bit of a, you know, a little bit of an increase there, and then he yeah. can build off that. Okay, um, let's get to this series. Let's get to this series. Before I do that, I'm going to tell you about something because it's official, folks. They're playing the Nashville Predators. And we have an army. Nation Gear is ready to gear you up for Vancouver's playoff run. Rep your favorite team as they battle for the cup. Shop the exclusive We Have an Army playoff t-shirt and more at nationgear.ca. Okay, also, I, I should just throw this out there because there's been a couple people asking about it. Uh, we've been asking, oh, who wants to go watch this Game 82? 5 p.m. start on the road. Really isn't going to matter too much. And the answer was not many. Because uh, we, we're not going to have the watch party tonight. Uh, Greta is still going to be there. And of course, you can go watch the game at Greta. Uh, but we're, we're not going to be having the watch party tonight. Um, I, I know I said that earlier on earlier in the week as well. And there's stuff out in social media and stuff. But uh, you can go check it out. There's still game day deals over at Greta. So feel free to go. You absolutely should go. But again, not a ticketed watch party. You can still go, though. It's going to be a lot of fun uh, to check out Greta, Greta Bar, YVR. Okay um people are asking about the game starting on sunday <clears throat> i would assume if it's hockey in canada it's a 7 p.m start you'd assume i'd assume that but i mean we also don't have official word yet i believe john shannon tweeted today that it's going to be a double header for the canadian teams with winnipeg in the earlier game so you would assume that means a seven o'clock start for Ben. although we have seen playoff start times in the past start earlier but that's usually in the later rounds when there's not many games and you have you know eastern or central time zone so they can get them in primer viewing time right okay we've got uh, a few things about this Nashville series we're gonna have to get to some of them um in anyone else yeah we're gonna have to get some of them in anyone else but harm let's preview this series let's preview this series between the Canucks and the Nashville Predators some are calling it a first round buy but you're not buying that yourself, are you? I'm not, right? You look at since the All-Star break, the Predators have the second best power play in the NHL. And we know that sometimes when there are upsets in first round matchups, a lot of it is driven by special teams, right? So you have a national team that's been red hot on the power play, a Vancouver team that has been up and down on the power play since the All-Star break has found some better form in April, but had some lengthy stretches where they couldn't get it done on the man advantage. That's something to keep an eye on. And just in general, since the all-star break, Nashville is the second highest scoring team in the NHL. And of course the Canucks in that time have struggled to manufacture offense. They're 24th in the NHL in that time. Now that said, I still think the Canucks are clearly favored. And one of the other things from that perspective is a storyline that maybe people aren't talking as much about yet but I'll be keeping an eye on is Nashville plays this high octane rush style offense. What I wonder is, are they going to have a difficult time translating that recent offensive dominance into the playoffs? The reason I say that is you think about Andrew Burnett, who's the head coach of the predators. He coached the 2021, 22 Florida Panthers, right? That Panthers team was the highest scoring team in the NHL that year by a country mile. Average 4.1 goals per game. Wasn't even close, the second place team. 
They won the President's Trophy that year. They lapped the competition. They had so much speed, so much skill. They looked unstoppable, had 58 wins that season. Teams figured out how to shut that high-octane rush style down. Round one, they barely scraped by Washington, a Washington team that had no business going deep in the playoffs in the first place. And that's when people were like, oh, oh, okay, like what's going on here? You have a President's Trophy team that is barely squeaking by round one. And then they got swept in the battle of, uh, of Florida against uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning. They only managed three goals that entire playoff series. And, and it's because Washington and Tampa started to figure out how to slow them down in the neutral zone, push them to the perimeter. And they were a one trick pony in how they manufactured goals. Right. And that's part of the evolution of the Panthers since Brunette left is that Paul Maurice has come in and has changed the way the Panthers play to a style that's more suited for the playoffs, a heavier, grittier four check based style where you're able to get to the inside on a more, on a more consistent basis And this is where, from a strategic perspective, Vancouver's coaching staff is uh, going to play an instrumental role. Because look, over the course of a regular season, it's different for Nashville to find success in the second half offensively, just because between travel, between the volume of games that there are, and you're trying to take care of your own internal matters, your own power play, your own penalty kill, your own five on five play, your own lineup decisions, you don't have as much of an opportunity to do an extensive pre scout on your opponent. Yeah, like you'll generally know what systems they play, what looks they might give you on the power play, how they PK. But it changes come playoff time because the coaching staff is going to be, especially the video staff, they're going to be watching back mountains and mountains of tape on Nashville. And you can actively strategize against your specific opponent. And this is where the Canucks, who have been a top defensive team, I'm interested to see, can they find a way to nullify Nashville's rush-based offense and start pushing them to the outside? The other thing that people haven't spoken as as much about regarding their second half surge is that a lot of it has been against non-playoff opponents, right? Their record since January 1st against playoff opponents is 10-8-1, which is solid, right? They've won more than they've lost, but it's not exceptional. They've been beating up on non-playoff teams. And the other thing to keep in mind is Nashville was outside of a playoff spot when they were originally going on this run. And that means even from an opponent's perspective, like you're going to get backup goalies more often teams aren't going to take you as seriously. Um, So that's the first thing that I'm going to be looking for is can Nashville's recent rush based offensive success actually translate come playoff time. So since January 1st, the Vancouver Canucks are 27, 12 and six, the Predators 27, 14 and four. And as you said, a lot of non-playoff teams in there as well. But look, this is including that the Canucks had those kind of off months. And again, the time without Thatcher Demko definitely hurt this team. Harm, you had an interesting stat for us here about teams and you tweeted it out. Teams that, what was it, missed the playoffs and then won the division? Was that what you? It was. So I looked since 2000 how many teams that missed the playoffs in consecutive seasons then immediately took the step forward to 100 and pl- 105 plus points in the regular season? Like how did those teams perform in the playoffs? Right. And what I was trying to capture was this idea that what happens when there's a surprise team that basically skips a level, right? Goes straight from has been out of the playoffs for multiple years. And now they aren't just in the playoffs. They're not just squeaking in, but they're dummying teams dominating in the regular season. What happens in the playoffs? Because uh, sometimes there's a narrative. And I do think that some teams around the NHL, some executives can look at a team like Vancouver and say, okay, given their lack of playoff experience, they haven't been here before. Like, can you really go from being a bottom feeder to immediately being a Stanley cup contender? Or do you have to, learn how to win in the playoffs right and this is where it was interesting to see it's happened 11 times um six out of those 11 made it past round one four of those 11 made it to the made it to a conference final which is 36 percent, pretty good rate and funny enough one of them won the stanley cup and that cup winning team was jim rutherford's 2006 carolina hurricanes do you believe you have to believe hearing that stat? You have to believe, folks. You have to believe in this. Okay. Um, and that's good stuff, Harm. That's really good stuff. Back to the Predators a little bit here. I want to talk about the goaltending matchup. 
Let's break that down. UC Soros versus Thatcher Demko. Both guys playoff experience. Basically, for Soros, it doesn't start and end in the playoff bubble. But that's the last time UC Soros played playoff games, right? Was in the bubble. So you look at those numbers in the bubble. You look at his numbers more recently. This should be a pretty even matchup when it comes to goaltending. Um, Soros had a bit of a down year this year, but he's kind of coming alive at the right time. And I'm not just saying that based on numbers. Like I've actually watched some Predators games and like UC Soros has been better. Like UC Soros has cleaned up some things in his game that I think were slipping early on. And I, I still give the edge to the Canucks. Um, Demko's just been steady all season long. Demko had a couple little blips, but every goalie has those. And Saros is, have been there have been more of them, and they have been for longer periods of time. Demko also, like, I, I still give them the advantage, even though Demko's just coming back from an injury. I liked how he looked in that Calgary game. He's going to play in Winnipeg tonight, and to all those people out there, saying rest Demko, rest Demko. I don't know what you're talking about. Demko himself, like Demko himself, Harm, said that he still had a couple things he wanted to, like he wants to play in tonight's game. He wants to get the feel for the puck a little bit more. He wants to clean up some things in his game. That's what he said. He wanted to play in tonight's game and he absolutely should be. He, you should be getting him as much as much time as you can before Sunday night's game uh, against the Predators. But I give the advantage to the Canucks in goal, but it's very, very close. And again, you're predicting goaltending. It can change. Like it can change on night one and then it can stay that way for the rest of the playoffs. So I am giving the advantage to the Vancouver Canucks in the goaltending department with Thatcher Demko. Like Thatcher Demko is going to be a Vesna candidate this year. UC Saros is not. I am giving them, I am giving Thatcher Demko and the Canucks the edge in the goaltending department here. Yeah. And Nashville's going to need Saros to be exceptional to is such a central part of why they've been successful down the stretch here because again they play I don't want to say a looser style but again they're a team that likes to uh, likes to attack open things open things up a little bit they're middle of the road defensively when you look at their um, chance shots against metrics at five on five uh, and this is where if you have an elite goaltender who's on top of his game, if you if you get into the types of games where you're trading chances a little bit and you're able to dictate the pace of play to your terms at a higher ramped up uh, style, then if you've got a hot goaltender, you can make it work, right? And so, again, from Vancouver's perspective, I don't think they'll want to get into um, the type of game where they're trading chances all of a sudden because the Canucks aren't a rush-based offensive team. They'll ironically want to not slow the tempo of the game down because Vancouver's defensive su success is predicated on how quick and aggressive their forecheck is, how fast they pressure the puck. Um, but they're not going to necessarily want to open it up. And yeah, from a goaltending standpoint, give the slight edge to the Canucks, but um, it's, it's so interesting looking at, and this isn't necessarily relevant to Demko versus Saros because the gap isn't as substantial, but just looking at what happened in, in the biggest goaltending mismatches of uh, of last year's playoffs, right? Like you had Florida versus Boston, right? Vesna winner and Allmark versus uh, Alex Lyon was Florida's game one starter. But Brovsky wasn't even in, in net yet, and Florida upset them, right? Uh, New Jersey versus Rangers, Vanacek versus Shesterkin, Devils uh, came out and won, Brossois versus Hellebuck, Vegas still won, um, there were a couple other examples. Uh, Carolina uh, beat the Islanders, even though the Islanders had Sorokin, right? So goaltending is really, really difficult to predict in the first round. The other example was Vasilevsky versus uh, Samsonov, and yet the Leafs still won in round one. So you can have a series where there's a goaltending edge on paper, and just because it's such a small sample size, uh, the opposite can still sort of come true where the unexpected happens, but. Yeah, you're giving the slight edge to Vancouver for now. Okay, forward and defense group. Forward, I th are we both going to agree that Vancouver also has a slight edge? And I think a lot of people might think it's a bigger edge, but I'm giving them a slight edge because Nashville's forward group has been good. I know, look, you see names on there that you look at and say, okay, I don't, who the hell is Bobby McMahon type thing, right? Like <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people having those kind of questions looking at this lineup, but they've been good. Like they've they've been a solid forward group. I'm giving I'm still giving the slight edge to the Canucks. Like the Canucks should 
have the advantage when we talk about matchups and why we like this matchup for the Canucks. The Canucks should have the advantage here when you look at the forward groups. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Agreed. With Nashville, uh, their top line has been surprisingly good, right? You wouldn't look at O'Reilly, Forsberg, and Gus Nyquist as oh, an upper echelon first line in the NHL. Like We all know they're talented players, but you wouldn't expect them to um, be terrorizing teams, and yet they've got elite underlying numbers. And Philip Forsberg, for example, he's got 24 goals in his last 31 games. Uh, Nyquist, right? He's not a big name player. He's got 37 points in his last 30 games. Uh, that top line has been hot. And I'm curious to see from a matchup perspective how the Canucks will approach it. And this is part of why I love playoff hockey is it becomes like a chess match with uh, the matchups, especially when you have uh, home ice and in last changes. Are you going to go power versus power and take, say, the JT Miller line and go head to head against Nashville's top line? Or I'd be considering throwing the Lindholm Garland Joshua line out there as a checking line against them. Hope that they keep things relatively close because then you free up the Miller line and the Pedersen line to feast on Nashville's middle six, which isn't nearly as strong, strong, right? Like imagine game one and two, you can get the JT Miller line potentially out there against. Sisson, Zucker, and Jankowski, right? That's a significant mismatch. Uh, or the Pedersen line against Tommy Novak, Evangelista, and Bovillier. And I love uh, Novak and Evangelista, but the Pedersen line on paper is going to have a pretty sub a, a substantial edge there. So from a matchup perspective, I'm curious to see how they're going to approach um, trying to shut Nashville's top line down. What forward line do the Canucks throw out there? I wonder if there's people in Nashville, like Predators Conversation. Okay, maybe they have a better name than that. But, the, you know, the, a Nashville-based Predators podcast talking about, um, well, Ely McKayev's in the top six in Vancouver, so I like this matchup for Nashville. I, want, <laughs> I wonder if there's any Nashville podcast out there having the same thoughts. But you're right, like we agreed here. Uh, the edge goes to the Canucks in the forward group as well. But it's still, it's, it's interesting to watch, right? Especially when you have the matchups, like you said. Uh, okay, defense. I'm curious your thoughts on this one because... Roman Yossi is going to be number two on my Norris ballot. Quinn Hughes is number one. Canucks have Quinn Hughes. I don't know which way I'm going on this one, but I, I think, again, I'll probably sound like a giant homer, but again, I'm giving the edge to Vancouver. How do you think the defense groups match up? Here's how I'd break it down. So the top pair of Yossi and McDonough has been spectacular, right? Their numbers together at five on five actually slightly better than Hughes Hirona together, right? And you think about why that might be, and it's because Hughes has been better than Yossi, of course, but in the second half, the difference has basically been negligible, right? They're both playing at a superstar elite level. Uh, first half, I think the edge between Hughes and Yossi was sizable, but in the second half, they've basically been playing neck and neck. <laughs> but where Nashville's top pair separates itself just slightly is Ryan McDonough is a better player than Philip Ronick, right? McDonough struggled in his first year in Nashville last year, but he's had a terrific bounce back year. He's been one of the top shutdown defensemen in the NHL. Uh, analytically, he's even chipped in with, I think, 20 points in his last 30 games or something along those lines. Like he's come alive offensively too. And McDonough, you think about his pedigree too. This was the guy that Tampa Bay leaned on to take on the toughest matchups during their uh, cup run, right? They'd use that headman D pair. They wouldn't use that against top competition. They would have McDonough and Chernak defending top lines. So McDonough as a two-way presence, as a driver, is um, is better than Heronic. So you'll have a, maybe I'll have a slight edge or it's it, it's a wash, basically, the top pairs, you, you, you can call it. But where the Canucks sort of have a uh, potential edge is the bottom four because if you if Nashville does indeed stack McDonough and Yossi together then I think they're a little bit too top heavy with their decor right like hmm. their second pair potentially could be Jeremy Lazan and Alex Carrier Carson Soucy is way better than Jeremy Lazan like it's not close between those two in terms of the, your second um your second left shot defenseman so that's where the Canucks, I think, start to separate a little. And that's why on the blue line as a whole, um, 
I mean, again, even on the third pair, right? Right now they've got Spencer, Stasny, and Luke Shen uh, penciled in. And look, I love me some Luke Shen, but Zdorov and Cole, I think, is um, is a better defense pair there too. So uh, you're giving the edge, I think, to the Canucks blue line as well, even though the top pairs might be a wash. Some old friends, Anthony Beauvillier is slated to play on the third line for Nashville. And Luke Shen, like you said, Luke Shen as well. Um that's the one thing I'll say is playoff series get physical. You want to have Luke Shen on your team. Y- you don't think Luke Shen's going to hold up on hitting anybody. That's for damn sure. Like, I don't know. I Luke Shen's not a dirty player. I think that's something at least Canucks fans can be happy about is if he lays someone out, it's not going to be like a cheap shot. He's a clean player. Yeah, and the Canucks have um, the, the meat and potatoes now themselves too, right? With guys like Zadorov. Stussy, I know Myers isn't always physical, but he's a massive body. Cole plays a heavier style. Uh, and, and again, from Nashville's perspective, right? They are accustomed to having time and space in the neutral zone, right? That time and space shrinks in the neutral zone. So are they going to be able to consistently get to the inside? I'm confident that their top line can because O'Reilly and Forsberg are, are veteran players. And, and, and in O'Reilly's uh, in O'Reilly's case, he's a proven playoff performer, but in their middle six, like they've got some younger players. Are they going to be able to consistently box out, win net front battles um, against some of Vancouver's bigger defensemen in the bottom four there? And that's where, again, like I'm going to be interested to, interested to see the, the X factor from Nashville's perspective in their middle six is going going to be Novak and uh and Evangelista they they're basically stylistically very different but in terms of impact they're Nashville's equivalent of Josh Wynn Garland in terms of having that chemistry um elite play driving numbers like they've controlled nearly 60% of expected goals together Novak has 22 points in his last 31 games and and keep in mind last year he quietly had 43 points in 51 games very crafty, creates a lot of zone entries. He's got a sharp shot, pretty good offensive vision too. And Evangelista's a, a rookie. Um, how are they going to fare in, in playoff hockey, right? Um, because those are, like outside of Nashville's top line, those are two of their most dangerous uh, players in the middle of their lineup. And if Vancouver can find a way to slow those guys down, then all of a sudden, I think Nashville could be struggling for secondary scoring from their forwards. Okay, I'm just looking this up. Yeah, I was looking it up. Because JT Miller's last time playing non-bubble playoff hockey was with the Tampa Bay Lightning when they got swept by the Columbus Blue Jackets. Now, I bring this up, Harm, because someone out there is for sure going to bring up that the Canucks have a lack of actual playoff experience. Like, Nobody nobody on this team has ever played a playoff game at Rogers Arena. None. Zero. Zero have played a game at Rogers Arena during the playoffs. JT Miller is one of them who has played in the playoffs, and JT Miller is one of them who, aside from just being a leader on this team, like he knows what it's like to fail in the playoffs. And I just in the conversations that you know we've we've heard and quotes we've seen from JT Miller it really seems like he learned a lot from that series. And while the Canucks don't have a ton of, you know, we've been there, we've done that when it comes to playoffs in their lineup, they've got JT Miller there. They've got Ian Cole there. And one thing I want to point to is the coaching staff. Like the coaching staff has been there. The coaching staff has been to the playoffs. And <clears throat> I'm just looking at it and saying, okay, you're, you're going to want more experience, obviously. Like it'd be nice if guys were in the playoffs year after year. but I'm not looking at this as some great weakness for this team. Like, I feel like this team knows what they're getting themselves into here. Yeah, especially because you might be a little bit more worried about it if they were going up against Vegas, right? Maybe if they were going up against LA, even just because they play more of a playoff style where there there isn't a lot of space defensively. Uh, But in the West, Nashville plays a style that least resembles playoff hockey. Right. And again, that doesn't mean that they're that the series is going to be a cakewalk. This doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Like it, I expect it to be sort of close. And if I had to give an official prediction or, sh- or sh- are we holding those off or should I just spill it now? 
give your prediction. We're going to do brackets tomorrow. We're going to do actual brackets yeah. tomorrow. Uh, like I've got the Canucks in six, which means I'm expecting a competitive series. But as far as the idea of building some experience in round one, like this is again why Nashville is like was the more favorable opponent is like, I, I, again, I think your lack of experience may have been more of a, a talking point if it's against LA or, or Vegas, one of those teams that actually resembles this tight checking, uh, defending the slot exceptionally well type of uh, team. I'm going to say Canucks in five, but I'll do my bracket tomorrow. Of course, you're going to go in five. I was I was surprised you didn't say in four, honestly. Well, I'm thinking about it. I might do four, but I don't <laughs> want to sound like some giant homie, yeah. but I don't know. I'm confident. Yeah, like, I don't I'm think confident. it'll be a sweep. No, it probably won't be. Again, that's the thing is like, in if we're actually breaking this down, it's fun to say, oh, Canucks in three, Canucks in four. It's, it's fun to say that. It's fun to say that. But if we're thinking about this logically, Harm, like, here's a prediction for you. UC Soros is going to steal one game in this series where the Canucks outwork the Predators. The Canucks look like it's a game they should win. UC Soros is going to steal one game in this series. That's going to be my prediction. That's one prediction that I'm going to head for you. Okay, so now the Canucks have, don't have the sweep. I'm going with five. I'm going to say Canucks in five. Cool, yeah. I'm uh, I'm on board with that. The like From Vancouver's perspective, obviously winning is the most important part, but there's an extra bonus or incentive if you can get it done quickly, right? Because yeah. of all of the travel, how long of a flight that is, especially if you end up in in a you know game six, seven situation. Look, if your scenario um, comes to fruition and it's five instead of six and the Canucks can avoid another, another trip to Nashville and back, that, um, that would then set themselves up better from a rest and fatigue standpoint than round two. But of course, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. It's <laughs> not even a guarantee that the Canucks win round one in the first place, but just another thing to to keep in keep in mind if the Canucks, if they end up in a situation where they um, have an early series lead. Here's a question: Should they just rest Hughes for this entire round? Just wait till round two to get him out there. This is the bulletin board material that Nashville is going to use. They're going to be playing this podcast clip. They're going to make like a video montage of of everything you've said on this episode so <laughs> far, and um, and they're going to be like, look. They think we're a joke. Well, I mean, that's, and again, of course, of course I'm joking, but like, that's what Willie Desjardins did in 2015. Like the Sedins were, again, they weren't healthy scratched, but they weren't used nearly as much. And I think, didn't Willie even admit it that like he was resting them for round two and he regrets doing it or something? Someone help me out here. Wasn't it just as simple as he just always rolled four lines? Yeah, but he said later on, I think he like came out and said, like, yeah, I regret doing that. Like I should have I shouldn't have done that. I gotta find why it. are we back on Willie? Like, this is not the playoff flashbacks I want to be thinking about. Fair enough. Okay, I don't need to find it, but someone help me out. Someone someone will know if I'm right. But anyways, that's you know, it's the old Willie D special. Rest Queen Hughes for round two. Okay. Um yeah. Let's get to, or is there anything else you want to get to on this series before we get to anyone else? Uh, we can move to anyone else. I'm sure there are going to be some fascinating questions. I'm sure we're still going to be talking about the Nashville Predators or the Nashville Pooditors, as some of us are calling them. Okay. It's time for anyone as else. As you presented. specifically are calling them. <laughs> presented by DoorDash. Anyone else? It's our listeners' chance to get involved and hit us up in the YouTube live chat. And it's also our listeners' chance to get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when they download the DoorDash app and enter code NATION25. That's all capital letters NATION and the numbers 25. Offer value in Canada, subject to change. Terms do apply. With Double Dash and DoorDash, you can order from multiple restaurants or stores in the same delivery without additional delivery so everyone can get what they want and need. The promo code is NATION25. Okay. Let's get to anyone else. Um, uh, one thing actually quickly I should bring up is we're breaking this series sort of down on on paper, right? And we're saying, okay, slight edge to the Canucks with their forward group. When you look at um, these teams on paper, the Predators have been greater than the sum of their parts, right? That's one thing to keep in mind is, is especially in speaking to 
because um, I'm working on a, a, a piece nationally getting NHL executives to sort of rate every playoff team into tiers. And naturally, I'm asking them, uh, uh, asking a bunch of them about Nashville. And, and one theme that's come up is they're better than the sum of their parts. And so you don't want to take a team like that lightly, especially when they are hot. Because you can think back to, for example, in round one last year, right? Colorado versus Seattle. Colorado wins the division. How many people would have been breaking the series down on a podcast like this and honestly saying that Seattle has an edge here or has an edge here? There, there would have been zero parts of the roster. Maybe the bottom six. The bottom six would have been an area where you, where you would have said, okay, Seattle's a bit deeper there. But other than that, you would have said Colorado has more star power. They're their top pair is better. The depth of the blue line is better on paper. Like these teams aren't even close. And yet we saw Seattle take down Colorado in round one. Right. So that's something to obviously be cognizant about is, is we can break these teams down on paper and um, say positionally you have advantages here and those are real. They matter, but it's, that's not, that's not the be all end all of, of how you want to look at a series like this. Hockey's played on the ice, not the calculators. All right. Um, we have a few things, and anyone else, that I want to get to. This is an interesting one. And I don't know if... I don't know how in-depth you want to go. But I'll, I'll just... I'll dumb the question down a little bit. This person asked, what are your predictions for next season? Let's not get into too many individual predictions or anything like that, Harm. Are the Canucks a playoff team next year? I'm going to say yes. I mean, probably, but it's it's like impossible to predict right now. We don't know what the Canucks roster looks like. We don't know what other rosters look like. It'd be a massive disappointment if they miss the playoffs next year after taking such a big step this year. But, I mean, you can't sit here and make those predictions now. We haven't even started the playoffs this year. I'm already saying it. Top of the division next year. But uh, there was one thing that I actually did want to say because you brought up being a disappointment if they miss next year. But before this series, before we even knew who the opponent was, we were talking about this on the rink wide round table a while ago, that what would be a, you know, what would be a disappointment for this team at this juncture? Like they, at that point, they couldn't have missed the playoffs. So we knew they were going to do that. I said, choking away the Pacific would have been a disappointment and losing in round one would have been a disappointment. But then as we got closer to playoffs, it's like, okay, if you get knocked off by Vegas, those are the defending cup champs and you know, they're cheating. We know that LA you're a little more disappointed, but I'm going to say flat out if they lose to Nashville and not again, not trying to take Nashville lightly, just given where the Canucks are in the standings and what they've accomplished this year. I think it's a disappointment to lose to Nashville in round one. And I I don't even think that's a hot take. I think every player in the locker room, everybody in the organization would be saying the exact same thing. Oh yeah. 100%, especially because, look, there's a scenario where Edmonton could come out of the Pacific Division. And honestly, if you end up with Vancouver versus Edmonton in round two, Edmonton's probably going to be viewed as the slight favorite by most people around the league. But stylistically, it's, it's a matchup that you feel confident in that you're going to make it a competitive series and that you could win. Right. So there's a legit pathway to making the Western conference final. Again, one step at a time, right? (laughs) First, you got to win game one against Nashville, but there's a path there, right? Like compare how compare their path to let's say like a central division. um, Yes. Team like, like whether it's, I mean, all the all those Dallas, Colorado, Winnipeg, they're all such high quality teams. And like Dallas could win the division, win the conference and get Vegas in round one. Right. It's a difficult path out of the central, whereas in Vancouver, it's not an easy path, but it is a little bit more favorable. And so to me, yeah, losing in round one would be for sure a disappointment. And taking it a step further, like, you know, if they can manage to get by Colorado or Dallas in the Western Conference final. You got a Stanley Cup final matchup against Florida. That's a favorable matchup for the Canucks. I, I think Canucks in five. Stop trolling me. <laughs> you saw me grinning ear to ear. For those on the podcast, you can't see it. But as soon as Harmon was like, 
already projecting round two and like yeah you know if it's Edmonton and what you said obviously was a really good point but I was gritting ear to ear which is why you ultimately <laughs> jumped in and said okay one step at a time because you knew I was about to throw in oh first and second round by oh my gosh great good news for the Canucks yeah I it's always a delicate uh, balance when I'm having <laughs> conversations with you <laughs> okay uh this is an interesting one from Nirav here uh, okay, who's the most important player you think the Canucks could lose to injury and still expect to win the first round? Most important, let's say, out of the top three defensemen and top six forwards. I'm going to say most important player you think they could lose and still expect to win the first round. Like, I don't know if you can, if you, I think you could say Carson Susie or Philip Ronick. And again, you're obviously we're not wishing anybody harm, but. They have played without Carson Susie. It wasn't pretty, and Carson Susie's really underrated. I would say Philip Peronic. I, I feel like there's something bad luck, bad vibes from answering. It's a, a listener like question. It's a listener I, uh, question. You don't have okay. to answer it. You don't have to answer it. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. No, I bad it. vibes. Bad vibes. Yeah, bad vibes. Bad vibes. Okay. People are uh, wanting to talk more playoff flashbacks. If we're going to talk flashbacks, let's talk Kessler in 2011. Ryan Kessler was on Donnie and Dolly today. Said he still keeps up with the Canucks. Said he still feels like a Canuck. Harm, what do you remember of that series? And again, it's always going to be known as the Kessler series. It was electric, right? And Kessler was my favorite player growing up. I um I had a Kessler jersey growing up. And in fact, I I was so used to seeing like the blue home jerseys that I specifically wanted the away white ones. Um, and so seeing Kessler in those obviously road uniforms lighting the Predators up uh, was unbelievable. And I mean, the inside outside move on one of those goals is still burned into my memory. I mean, he just put them on, on his back and it's funny. Murph had, um, had a tweet today and he, he, as, as far as a flashback, he pointed out that Joel Ward had four goals and four assists Yep. in that series too and it just reminded me about how quietly dominant he was and how he emerged as like a newborn hero uh and yeah man that uh that playoff run was uh was something else knuckhead remember there's no such thing as jinxing say whatever you want just know that you can get memed for it later and of course that's what we're watching out for i don't believe in jinxes i, I don't believe yeah it. well i don't want to get memed right like imagine saying oh i think they can if this guy gets hurt, they'll they'll still win. And I don't know, bad vibes, bad meme potential. Don't like it. Nar, I expect Garland to come to training camp significantly taller next year. No, in my experience, doesn't happen the way you want it to. Doesn't happen. You can do all the stretches you you can find. Not gonna help. Not gonna. Does help. your mom okay. still tell you that uh, you're you're a growing boy? I, I I mean, I still outgrow some clothes every once in a while. So I don't. You tell me harm. You tell me. I'm, just growing, I'm growing the wrong way now. I'm growing the wrong way. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, I wanted to find this. I got to scroll up for it. Excuse me. Okay, maybe it's gone. Maybe I just missed it. Oh, no, here we go. Harm, we'll close out with two more. This one from Karn. Is it easier to defend rush-based offense versus more cycle-focused teams, or is it just two different beasts? It's a good question. I think it comes down to this is, are you a one trick pony, right? Because some teams, they attack off the rush, but they can also create off the cycle. They can create off the four check in zone. They're a team that passes the puck really well. They have players that can get to the greasy areas. Like you want an offense that's a versatile and versatile offenses are the most difficult, I think, to um, to defend against, because if you shut down one part of how they generate offense, they still find another way, right? And that's what a team like Tampa could do, for example, when they won their cups was they're a team that Nikita Kucherov can make his fancy east-west passes off the rush and, and those feel unguardable, but that was also a team that could create off uh, off the forecheck. Now, if it's just one of those in, in the sense of if you do have a one-trick pony, which one-trick pony is... Um, easier to maybe stop it's um it's probably a rush based um you know offensive team uh give the slight edge to unless of course they have 
a mega superstar like uh like a McKinnon um then it's a little bit different but you know Nashville doesn't have a a, a player like that and, and to be clear I'm not guaranteeing that Nashville is a one trick pony in, in the way that they create off the rush. Like maybe they will adapt this time, right? Maybe Brunette has learned from his past playoff failure in Florida and they have other ways of generating offense. I mean, you look at their top line, for example, and I, I look at O'Reilly as a heavier player down low and I'm like, okay, that's a line that could create off the cycle for sure. That's a line that can adapt, but it then comes down to their middle six is you know, especially their young guys like Tommy Novak, Evangelista, guys that have been so instrumental for their second half success. Um, how are they going to adjust if the Canucks do an effective job of taking their time and space away off uh, off the rush? Okay, I saw this and I'm sure you saw it as well, Harm. A Canucks fan posted that they were trying to buy a ticket for the game, but it was it said Ticketmaster told them it was reserved for nashville predators area fans or whatever I, my understanding because i think that has grown into a if you're from vancouver you can't buy a ticket to the game and i mean i know i should have done this this myself and just tried to go see if i can find it on Ticketmaster. but like my understanding is it's just a kind of sectioned off cheering section right like it's not like a you can't buy a ticket if you're from Vancouver. Like, that's not how I understand it. I don't know. I saw people tweeting about it, but I'm like, I haven't gone on Ticketmaster myself and poked around. Okay, well, I'm going to do that. The question from Karn, uh, or excuse me, from Karen Versation is the NHL should ban teams from trying to keep opposing fans out of their stadiums. If you're such a poverty franchise that that week of a fan base that you need to worry about it, relocate to Quebec City. Yeah, but... Look, if I was Buffalo, if Buffalo ever makes the playoffs, right, and you get the Toronto Maple Leafs in round one, especially given how expensive ticket prices are in, in Toronto, like, I don't care. If I'm I, if I'm the owner of the Sabres, I'm saying, yeah, I don't want Toronto fans invading our building and having go Leafs go chance. Like, home ice matters. So, like, I get where the sentiment comes from, but, I mean, in specific scenarios, I guess if it's a rivalry um, or a situation where it's a fan base as large as the Leafs and you know that they're coming, going to be coming down in um, in massive hordes, then I can at least understand the the rationale behind saying, hey, we don't want um, out-of-market fans dominating our, uh, our building here. Okay, I looked it up. I'm pretty sure it's just a restricted sales section. Like, it's just a section of fans. So, like... That's my understanding of it. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I like almost accidentally bought tickets for the game because of how far I went into this project. I don't know if maybe I would got to the the actual buy tickets button if it would tell me that I can't, but I ain't taking that risk. All all I can see, like I see the note, it said a restriction a restricted sales area has been set up for this game, but and that ticket transfers are are gone, so there's no secondary market if you want to go buy them that way, but uh, to me, that's just like it's a part of it. They're they're sectioning off part of the game for Nashville fans. But man, there's a lot of tickets available, and I know there's no date yet. But I wonder like how many Canucks tickets are available. Do you know like what tickets I are don't. costing for this playoff series? Okay, let's find out. I just I don't know if that's as big of a deal as I the question was because I think on Twitter it got blown out of proportion. From what I can see, you can buy tickets if you want. Like you can go buy tickets, and again, there's no limit for Canucks Canucks tickets but yeah one ticket is 240 with all the fees and taxes and everything 240 is the in cheapest Nashville? ticket you can buy no Vancouver. Vancouver sorry Vancouver game one uh which will be Sunday night it looks like but it still says TBD on Ticketmaster but it looks like Sunday night for game one and it's gonna be a lot of fun uh we'll I don't even know we're gonna do playoff brackets tomorrow we'll talk about the game a little bit more and we'll see We'll see. We'll uh, from there. And Grady said, uh, is pointing out, uh, Sino Chick was saying in the chat that it's the billing address on the credit card you use to make the Ticketmaster purchase. So I would get a refund if I went through with the purchase kind of thing? I mean, maybe they won't let you, let you go through with the purchase if your billing address is outside. But that, okay. Of the Tennessee area. Not to get too in-depth on my Ticketmaster account, but like, I'm pretty sure my credit card's already on there. 
maybe. I mean, you could always test it. <laughs> nope, not doing that. There's no resale. I'd have to. I'd have to commit and fly to Nashville. Speaking of which, um, yeah, you're gonna be flying to Nashville, and it's gonna be a good time. And we're gonna do some shows. We're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna do the shows with you on the road, but we'll get it done. We'll get it done, and it'll be a good time. But we'll close it out there. Yeah, you know, Karen Versation saying it. It won't let you buy it. Okay saying it won't let me buy it. I don't know. I don't know if that's true, but from what I can see, it just says restricted sales area. Like part of the seats are set aside. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Someone figure it out. Someone try to buy tickets properly. But anyways, we'll close it out there. For my co-host, Harmon Dial, my name is David Gudrelli. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Canucks Conversation. Canucks Conversation with Harmon and Quads brought to you by the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X's fresh look is just an added bonus to its range since you can drive up to 406 kilometers on a single charge. That's enough to get you from Kitsilano to Whistler or Kamloops to Kelowna and back and still be home in time for the game. Now that's what we'd call electric. The best part, by choosing electric, you can get up to $11,000 in rebates and incentives the BZ4X are in stock and selling quickly, so make sure to visit shoptoyota.ca or your local Pacific Toyota dealer to get your hands on one. Canucks Conversation is live Monday through Friday, every weekday at 2 p.m. over on the Canucks Army YouTube channel. Make sure you like, subscribe, and interact in the YouTube live chat every day with us, folks.